CNN's Matt Egan is here with the details. This is fascinating. John, it is fascinating. Donald Trump looks like he's on the verge of a massive financial win. His social media baby, Truth Social, is finally about to go public after years of legal delays. Shareholders are likely to green light a merger between Trump Media and a blank check company called Digital World Acquisition. Now, if you look at a live look at that stock price, pre-market it is up 3%. The higher this stock goes, the richer Donald Trump is, at least on paper, because this deal calls for Donald Trump to own about 79 million shares of the new company. So at these prices, we're talking about a stake that is worth more than three billion dollars that's huge that is almost 10 times the bond that he's supposed to post by monday in new york now here's the bad news it's not like donald trump can just take that stake it's not like it's sitting in robin hood account and he can sort of just tap a button and send it over to letitia james and the new york authorities in fact, some experts are telling me that that stake is likely less liquid than his real estate holdings hmm. for a few reasons. One, deals like this, they have lockup restrictions. Insiders are basically agreeing not to immediately dump their stock as soon as the ink is dry on the deal, right? That's never a good look, but it's especially bad look in this deal because Donald Trump isn't just the face of the company, he's arguably the product itself. So experts say these restrictions would likely prevent him from selling or even borrowing against this stock at least anytime soon. Okay, but even if he got past that hurdle, this would be really hard to get a loan against because as soon as there was word that he was gonna sell, the stock would probably go down. So who would want to take that as collateral? Also, perhaps most importantly, experts say that Trump media is really overvalued. Yeah, talk about that a little bit more because there are all these reports that the share price, <coughs> price is being driven up. I don't wanna use the word artificially, but being driven up here. This is a social media company that's losing users. It is, so this company is burning through cash. It's piling up losses. In the third quarter, it lost $26 million, generated revenue of just $1.1 million. And yet it's got this valuation in the billions. It doesn't really make any sense. Truth Social itself is shrinking the monthly active users down 39% year over year. Uh, one professor told me that, quote, the stock price is clearly a bubble. Another told me that at this point, it's basically a meme stock. So listen, yes, this is a financial win for Donald Trump, but no, it does not look like the golden parachute that he really needs right now. No, although $3 billion on paper, still pretty good. Not bad. A lot of us would take it. Matt Egan, thank you Thanks, very John. much. Kate? Joining us now for more on this is CNN senior legal analyst and former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, Ellie Honig. Ellie, let's jump off of what John and Matt were talking about. This true social sale likely to go through. If you're ranking Trump's options to come up with the money that he needs by Monday, how does this rank? Uh, it's a B minus for Trump because it looks good on paper. As Matt said, by the end of the day, Donald Trump could be worth several billion dollars more. But the problem is all about timing here, Kate, because in all likelihood, Donald Trump's shares are going to be locked up for six months, meaning he can't sell them off until six months from now. Now, there is a possibility he could go to the shareholders and ask for a waiver, ask for special permission to sell off some of them early. So that may give him a way around this. So he's going to be much richer, likely by the end of the day on paper. But the question is, when can he turn that into cash? Right. So how are the other options then looking as he gets closer to the Monday deadline? So two big things that we should be watching for today. Number one, does Donald Trump come up with some sort of cash infusion, whether through Truth Social, through a donor, through some benefactor, through a friend, through who knows what means. And the other thing we need to watch for is the appellate division. Remember, Donald Trump went to that court of appeals earlier this week and asked them to either delay or reduce the amount of the bond. Now, appeals courts do do that sometimes. They have the power to do that. It's hard to know how often they do it. There's no real data available, but there are certainly examples of appeals courts coming in and reducing bonds by 50, 60, 80 percent. So we've not heard yet from the appeals court and we could hear from them at any moment today. So we, can, we, can, we actually really can stand by to see if maybe we get some more information on that at some point today. Um, how does all of this impact his appeals? I'm, I'm kind of turned around on all of this, I think. 
I am glad you asked that question, Kate, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Yes, Donald Trump can still appeal no matter what. The bond does not impact his appeal rights. He has the right to appeal the case itself, and he will appeal it. Here's the difference. If he posts a bond, the attorney general cannot start collecting the judgment until the appeal is over. We're talking months or years from now. If he does not post a bond, however, the attorney general can start collecting on Monday. So we may have simultaneously Donald Trump appealing and the attorney general starting to collect on the amount of the judgment. So that's the difference. The bond matters a lot here, but yes, he can appeal with or without a bond. Let's turn to Georgia. Um, the judge there, we know, ruled that the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, can stay in the case. We learned that right here on the show. She's now pushing forward with a goal of getting Trump on trial before the November election. We have reporting that she intends to ask the judge for a trial start maybe this summer. Do you think that's possible? No, that's not going to happen, and the DA has to know that. The DA's most recent ask of the judge was to start trial in August. Even if that happens, even if the judge says, sure, we'll start in August, they're going to still be picking a jury come November, come the election day. Uh, so I think that, and the DA herself has acknowledged that if we start in August, as I'm asking, this trial is going to carry into 2025. That is just not a realistic ask. I think it's posturing by the DA. I think she wants to put out this perception of I'm ready to go. She knows darn well there's no way this case is going to start in August. There's no way this case results in a verdict before the election. You mentioned the jury. John spoke to Ashley Merchant, the defense attorney who kind of led the effort to disqualify Fonnie Willis. She represents one of the co-defendants. She thinks summer is not possible. And she also said this about jury selection to John. We're going to have to find jurors who have not already made up their mind. There's no way we're going to find jurors that don't know about this case. There's no way that they're not going to already have some type of an opinion. The question's going to be whether or not they can put that aside and be fair and impartial. It's going to take a very long amount of time. When it comes to jury selection, do you agree? She's exactly right. The goal is not to find 12 jurors who've never heard of the defendant. That would be impossible in this case. It's to find 12 jurors who can be fair. But the trick for lawyers on both sides here, and I've been through jury selection many, many times, is do you believe what the jurors are telling you? Sometimes you'll have a potential juror who will say, yes, I can be fair and impartial, but you don't believe them either way. And there's no science to that. It's really an art. You have limited information about the potential jurors. And sometimes you just have to rely on your gut instinct and say, I, I like this juror or I don't don't for our side. So jury selection is going to take a long time in any of these four Trump cases, and it's going to be complex, and it's going to be the whole ball game, Kate. So fascinating. Great to see you, Ellie. Thank you. Michael, let's talk about uh, Donald Trump, because he has just three days to post half a billion dollars in bond here, and we're seeing these new uh, filings. Well, they're, they're not new. They came in in early March. We just learned uh, that she filed these judgments up in Westchester County for some properties up there. Um, Trump's trying to scramble how to do this. The Biden campaign's calling him broke Don. Um, what do you see in all of this politically? I see a conflict between that which is best for Donald Trump personally and that which is best for Donald Trump politically. For example, it's probably in his personal best interest to declare bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy, something that he's not done in the past, but he has done with business entities relative to Atlantic City. But he doesn't want to do that because he thinks that takes away from the brand. And then similarly, it would be in his personal best interest to continue to fight the seizure of his real estate. But Casey, I'm not so sure that's bad for his political interest because my takeaway is that these four indictments, strange as it sounds, have benefited him, at least with Republicans. The optics of his real estate being seized by Letitia James, I think, might really motivate the base and cause some who are not in his camp to take a look at it and say, wait a minute, maybe it's gone a bit too far. You don't think that the bigger risk is to this idea that, you know, he's this great, because I mean, honestly, it's exposed the fact that he doesn't have half a billion dollars lying around when he constantly is out in public or, or used to be out in public saying, you know, I've got billions and billions of dollars in cash. Okay. And as if this election cycle were not nutty enough, now comes the possibility that next week, at least on paper, his net worth doubles. I thought that I thought that Truth Social was bombing. I had no idea that there was an IPO coming and the potential for the parent organization of his social media platform to put as much as $3.5 billion, at least on paper, in his pocket. He couldn't sell it for six months. But that's like the, a new wrinkle to all of this that, frankly, I hadn't seen coming. 
Yeah, I didn't either. I mean, there's some rules around that, right? In theory, he's not supposed right. to sell it or borrow against it for six months, but the people that control it are Trump supporters. I keep saying to, to people that we have no idea what's about to unfold in this campaign, that individuals whose names we don't even know right now and events that we could never forecast are about to unfold in a way that couldn't be imagined. I mean, it's just that kind of a cycle, unlike anything I've seen in the past. And this is the latest example of what I'm talking about.